you T. Wall who showed up today for the lunch and learn for Hanif Abdurraqib. Um, he is definitely excited to be here. I know you guys I just heard him two minutes ago say that I mean I'm really I'm really excited and anxious to be here. Um, and I know you all are also. Um, but as I said again, welcome to UNCA's Lunch and Learn as we bring Hanif Abdurraqib here. Um, he hails from Columbus, Ohio. Um, so just don't ask me any LeBron questions or any like Cleveland Cavalier questions. That we're, we're, we're trying to hold off on those questions. Um, but he is a poet, an essayist, and a cultural critic. Um, I'm just going to spotlight some of the numerous things. Gosh, it's a long list and he's just getting started. And I mean that he is just getting started. So he's already, so he's already received spotlight and remarkable talent for his work. Um, it's been shown NPR. It's been shown on Pitchfork, LA Review, in the New York Times, um, in the Chicago Tribune, um, and also in the Esquire. I mean, he's also on the cover. So if you guys get a chance to look on the cover of that magazine, and you guys will see definitely his beautiful face on there. All right. Um, he also just released a book called Go Ahead in the Rain, Notes to a Tribe Called Quest. So for all you hip-hop fans, a, tri a tribe called Quest is basically like his love letter for them. All right, guys? Um, but without further ado, bring to you an Ethan Derrick Key. Hey y'all. All right, so I, I know that um, several of you have questions about writing, but I also want to encourage you to ask questions about anything you're passionate about beyond writing. We can talk about, you know, I, I write about music for a living, so we can talk about music or popular culture and the movements of those things. We can talk about sports or the Midwest or sneakers or food or literally whatever, you guys, whatever you want. Um, I think conversations about writing are great, but I think conversations about the whole ecosystem of life around writing make the writing possible, so. Hi, what's your name? Hi, I'm Ivan. Hi. Um, what inspires you? Like, what kind of Um, I mean, I think it varies depending on the day, but, I, and I spend a lot of time in my head mapping out something to write before I write it, and so I think uh, when I kind of reach the boiling point of inspiration is when um, I have an obsession that shows up in every other part of my life that needs to get outside of my head and onto the page. Yeah. Hey, what's your name? One yeah. is from um, one of the students in our um, in our prison class. Yeah. And um, it is um, and, it, and it is also a question I have, and I'm sure a lot of other people have. Um, and there is the picture of Michael Jackson kin kissing Whitney Houston on the cheek. What's with all the ampersands? Is, is it is it just for poetic style, like a ginormous run-on sentence to set us further into the story, or just because? Well, it's, it's a stylistic choice, and I think um, I personally like the ampersand more than uh, the word and on the page because I think, um, you know, the word and is kind of like a stop sign and the ampersand is like a yield in a way. And so um, in the space of writing where I am attempting to invoke a type of breathlessness or a cascade of images or a cascade of narrative, I think the ampersand works because it does not present the reader with a, a another set of language to slow down the speed. Um, and I think the ampersand is malleable, right? The ampersand, particularly in that piece and in some of my other work, the ampersand can replace a period, it can replace a comma, it can replace an excessive kind of perfunctory language that takes away from the larger narrative arc. And so I like to think of the ampersand um, really as, as a catch-all tool to both speed up a narrative and help it flourish. And um, also, I'm a huge Bruce Springsteen fan. Yeah, and, me too. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, um, when one of our assignments was to read your piece, um, a day living in Bruce Springsteen's America, and then you talk about how um, how his album The River is sort of like um, it's, it's giving this idea of like what people want life to be like, but it doesn't exactly like like apply to everyone. Would right. you say that's for all of Bruce's music or just like specifically that album? Or is that kind of like change over time to more like encompass a larger group of people? Well, I think it's all of his music, but I mean, it got, Bruce Springsteen is the most important artist to me in my life. Um, you know, I, I love Bruce Springsteen and have kind of grown up with a lot of Bruce Springsteen mythology. 
Um, my dad is from Jersey. I spent a lot of time in New York and New Jersey when I was a kid. Um, and so I, I don't necessarily think the work of the artist is to speak for everyone. I think the artists fail when they attempt to encompass identities outside of the realm of their own, right? Um, Bruce Springsteen is interesting to me because I think his idea of where America and freedom intersect uh, is different, but perhaps adjacent to my idea of where America and freedom intersect, right? So I think through a lot of Springsteen's 70s career and some of his 80s career, there were these concepts and motifs about uh, labor as freedom, right? Um, or labor as a point of pride and then to leave the job was to get a, a fresh set of, of freedoms every day or every weekend. Um, and with that comes all the like trappings of what that means for him, you know, like convertibles and women in polka dotted dresses and diners. And it's very like New Jersey aesthetic, right? Um, and you hear it in like the Gaslight Anthem too, I think, also from the Jersey Shore. Um, and I, I don't think that labor is, because of the way the country is built and constructed, labor is not a source of freedom for everyone, right? Um, but what I like about Bruce Springsteen, what I've always liked about Bruce Springsteen, is that there's a generosity in how I've been allowed to view his America through his eyes, right? He's so tactile and he's so reliable as a narrator and he's so visual that my ability to view his America through his eyes has allowed me to take some different insights back to my America, right? Uh, and I've, I've really valued that, especially in my adult life and especially watching him age and kind of wrestle with his past work. Yeah, Yo, what's your name? Uh, Nathan. So kind of going off that piece uh, that he was talking about, I really like the Bruce Springsteen piece. Um, how, do you have like this, this uh, the meaning in your head and you look for a way to like explain it, like with um, going to that concert? Or do you kind of go to the concert and then think about it afterwards? Well, I tend to think about it afterwards. I oftentimes think of concerts um, as a series of happy or unhappy coincidences, right? Um, I got a lot of, um, there's been a lot of conversation about my writing around concerts, but I don't necessarily go to, because I go to enough concerts where nothing exciting happens or nothing curious happens or nothing beyond what's happening on the stage happens, which is fine, right? But I think, the best concerts for me are when uh, the geography of the room is perhaps as fascinating as whatever is happening on the stage, right? What is happening on the stage is something that happens every night on several stages, but what's happening inside the geography of the room is something that is potentially only going to happen in this group of people who came searching for the same kind of feeling, right? Um, and so I, I think, for example, the Springsteen concert, that. That piece came to life because it was my first week working for MTV News, and they asked me what I wanted to do, and I, I just love Springsteen, so I was, I like, was like, well, you get me Springsteen tickets, you know, like, I, I figured I worked for MTV and they could get me Springsteen tickets, um, so that piece didn't come. I didn't have any grand epiphany that sent me to that piece. I had just happened to be in St. Louis the night before, and the day before, and, and spent some time in Ferguson, and so I thought um, a lot about the disparity between that America I was dropped into to see Bruce Springsteen in New Jersey um, and to have flown to New Jersey from St. Louis, you know, being back in Ferguson for the first time since I was there the first time. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think in some ways um, I entered that concert, having been in Ferguson, I entered that concert perhaps looking for a way to make sense of the cultural gap that I had just naturally walked into the room with. Hi, what's your name? My name's Kaylee. Hey, Kaylee. Um, I really enjoy a lot of your imagery and a lot of your like, pieces. Um, being from Detroit, like a lot of it kind of connects with me because it's very like intimate things I remember from my childhood. And like, how do you like put those things together? Like in one, I think it was um, the picture of Michael Jackson kissing what you saw on the cheek. You said something along the lines of like red money wasted and like. Box machines and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, how do you like put that together? Yeah, first of all, Detroit's great and very important to me. I grew up in Columbus and Detroit's uh, in some ways like a sister city because it's so close and going up. Um, you know, I came up on like 
the punk scenes in the Midwest and um, Chicago was like a major punk and hardcore hub. But if you, if you were in Columbus and you didn't have like, if you had not enough gas money to get to Chicago and back in a night, you definitely had enough to get like to Detroit and back. So Detroit was like the secondary option, which is like, you know, I don't know. The shelter in Detroit's really important to me. Um, yeah, so I think a thing I've begun to think about largely is how, um, I don't know if any of you have ha ever had to live a life where you've watched someone kind of slowly lose their memory. Um, and it, it explodes back and bursts, but then it drifts away again. And so I've begun to think of, in, in the large catalog of privileges that are often to be considered, I've really begun to consider memory as a privilege, right? Memory is uh, the fact that, not only the fact that I have tactile memories, but the fact that I don't have a horrifying relationship with all of them. Those are dual privileges that I wield. And I, I think um, the best use of those privileges is to kind of um, build small and very touchable monuments to the moments that I've loved and lived so that they are breathing and accessible somewhere other than inside of myself, which is unreliable, right? The self is unreliable always um, because of the way the world, because of the fact that we're all going to one day not be here. Um, and so, I, and I think imagery is the most fascinating thing to play with in writing because um, it is the space where we can convince a reader to believe anything, right? Um, it is a space where the neighborhood I'm writing about can become your neighborhood just by virtue of wide generalities that have some life to them. If I can tell you what the tree looks like on my block and describe it with enough vivid flourish, you might see the tree on your block, right? And so really, it's both my thinking about memory as a privilege and in doing that, um, trying to build several bridges across several, mem several memories, right? So that not only are my memories echoing, yours are as well, and then the people who think about you and the people who think about them. Hi, what's your name? Hi, Lily. Hey, Lily. I think the only burden I really feel is a burden to rightfully and evenly articulate the people I know and love in the communities I've known and loved. Um, and that hasn't gotten harder for me to do. I think it has gotten harder perhaps to not view communities as monoliths, right? Because I think. Um, Whenever there's turmoil in a country or whenever there's a kind of a divisive thing happening within any republic, the idea is to kind of like separate the monoliths, right? And so people say, well, there are two Americas, which is wholly untrue, right? There are, you know, and then there are people who will say, well, there's, you know, the black American voter, but there are as many black American voters as there are black Americans voting, right? Um, and, and so I, I think it is harder in some ways, or there's a burden in some ways, because um, the work I do is rooted in not being an ethnographer and not being kind of the authority on a people. Uh, I'm barely an authority on myself. I mean, I think most of my work is trying to get to some level of authority on my own interior. And so I, I cannot speak for all of the black, I can't even speak for half the black people I know, you know? But I do think that there's, that's where the burden arises because I, I think, um, you know, as we see with the, the quote unquote American black intellectual, so many of them become burdened with the responsibility to speak for all. Um, and that's a bit rough. Hi. Hi, Thais. 
I recently read your critique on the Green Book. I'm just wanting to know <laughs> um, for you to just kind of share your thoughts. Well, you did very well in the essay, of course, but it just won an Oscar. Which means right. racism is over, I've heard. <laughs> and you said you got it when you walked out of the Green Book. Yeah, I did. And you said some other things. Yeah, I didn't finish it, but I'm told now that it's one best picture, people will stop wearing blackface. You know, it's so weird. There are all these people who are like, I didn't watch the Oscars, in part because I was on a plane, and in part because I just get exhausted by awards, and in part because I knew the Green Book was going to win best picture. And it baffled me, and I love so many of my peers who are critics, and but it baffled me that no one saw that coming. The minute, and I love Regina King, but the minute she won and the minute Black Panther won kind of the like periphery awards, I was like, I see what's happening. Mm. I see exactly what's happening. I don't even need to watch, like I'm gonna go to bed and wake up as a Green Book. This is the best. Also the Green Book is the, in a country where there are still so many people who think that being called racist is actually worse than racism, the Green Book is the movie the country deserves, right? Um, I did not finish Green Book, though I did get through most of it. I got through enough of it to realize that the plot wasn't going to turn, right? <laughs> but what breaks my heart the most is that Don Shirley was a fascinating man. Don Shirley was brilliant and unique and multifaceted and really singular, not just as a musician, right? But as a whole person who lived. And it breaks my heart that this is the film, the Don Shirley film we got, right? Um, also, the actual Negro Motorist Green Book, the Green Book itself, mm -hmm. is a fascinating, vital text, right? And the fact that the Green Book, um, the fact that the Green Book existed in America for as long as it did, uh, and the fact that there is still, and I write about this in a, that piece is like, the piece that you read is, an excerpt of a much longer piece. The fact that in some ways there is still a green book, it's just not the physical form. When I travel in unfamiliar places uh, and I see a black gas station clerk, for example, like for example, I, this past fall I had to drive across Mississippi, I had to drive from Oxford to Hattiesburg. Um, and when I stopped at a gas station in a really rural part, the black clerk told me where not to go to eat. That too is a type of green book, right? There's still the fact that there is still, uh, and I don't want to make, this is not to make light of the Underground Railroad, right? but there has always been in America a history of black people helping other black people get to where they need to go safely. Um, where's the movie about that? Where's the movie about the gas station clerk who tells people not to eat at the place that's unsafe for them? Or where's the movie about the hotel owner who you know, writes out a list of places to go? Or where's the movie about the person who tells you how fast to get in and out of the town? If we can't get the movie we deserve about Don Shirley, at least I would have loved one of those. But I was very happy for Regina King. I don't care a lot about awards, and I'm very ambivalent about awards, but I'm someone who grew up watching Regina King be very good in literally everything. I mean, from 227 to now, right? I mean, like, in every single thing. And, you know, to, to watch someone like that finally get their, get their roses was, was really beautiful. Um, I'm a bit ambivalent about Spike Lee because I didn't love the film, but I think that like a lot of people were like, well, glad Spike Lee won, wish it wasn't for that. But nonetheless, I just, in my mind, it's like Spike Lee won for Do the Right Thing. <laughs> <laughs> there was another moment like that where I was like, I'm going to tell myself this person won. Oh, it was Mahershala Ali. I was like, I'm going to just tell myself he won for Moonlight again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi, uh, Ken. Hey, Ken. Uh, I would wonder your take on, on Baldwin, uh, James Baldwin's work into film, and, and, and kind of doubling of Baldwin everywhere. Yeah, it's, it's funny you ask that, because I talk about that every single day, every time I do a Q&A, but it's often about, um, I get asked a lot about genre. So the, James Baldwin's most notable book of film criticism is called The Devil Finds Work. Um, and it's my favorite book of Baldwin writing. It's not, um, it's not great, I think, criticism, because he didn't have the tenets of a film critic, per se. You know, like, I think all the time, like, I want to write about food, but I don't really know shit about how to write about food, so it would really just be me saying stuff like, I don't like waffle fries, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, but I like The Devil Finds Work because it dawned on me that Baldwin 
essentially was just a witnesser of the world and decided to give his best possible writing to that which he witnessed, right? And so I love that he was essentially just a person at the movies returning to the page to give his best possible writing to that which he took in. And I think that is the entire tool for my writing toolbox, right? Is that essentially I want to be a person at the movies or whatever, like, you know, as metaphorical as that is, um, where I owe my best possible writing to the things I'm lucky enough to witness and my best possible criticism attempts at that which I'm able to witness. Um, and so that text of Baldwin's is maybe the most important to my um, writing ethos, even though I don't think it's his best work of writing, obviously. But I think um, it is the work of writing of his that feels the most unbridled in its curiosity. Yeah. So um, you said that, uh, that we could add this, um, ask sports questions. Yeah, yeah, same thing. So, um, so um, do you watch any like non-traditional or um, esports? I don't, but I'm now getting a really intense understanding of esports because um, a, a young person I mentor, I used to mentor, is very into esports now. Will like send me yeah. clips, mm -hmm. and I'm just like, cool. And I'm as someone who like plays video games but not very well because I don't have the time to anymore. Uh, although I want more time to, I finished the game in the winter. No, I finished it like last month. I finished Red Dead Redemption after a very long time. <laughs> it took me a very long time to finish. It was weird. It made me realize, one, how like kind of old I'm getting. Because um, I loved playing that game. And it still took me like three and a half months to finish it. And I was talking to my friends, and they were like, oh, I finished it in a week. Or I finished it in like two weeks. And I was like, yo, it took me so long. But last, there's like the last mission. It took me an hour to finish that. And I was like, yo, I'm not. The reflexes aren't what they used to be or something. Um, but yes, I, I don't watch esports, so I'm fascinated by esports. Um, and recently, I played a, a game of FIFA with a person on the internet uh, or like in the like digital ether, and they beat me really bad. And I was like, maybe it's time for me to, maybe it's time for me to retire the PlayStation controller. <laughs> and also, so like, um, especially since esports are like so, um, like, they're so defined and, and encouraged in places like Europe and in the Far East. Why, why, why do you think it's it's taking such a long time? Um, for, for, for them to be um, accepted in North America? I can't say for sure, but I would bet, I would just roll the dice and bet that it has something to do with America specifically and its relationship around labor and laziness and video game culture in general. Um, I don't, but I don't know, I can't say that for sure, but I would, I feel like so much, so many things trace back to this country's relationship with like what labor is and what production is, and what quote unquote real work is. Uh, but don't quote me on that. I'm not a <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, and then I'll get you. Um, what, do you have any advice for um, like a young writer trying to break into the industry? <laughs> well, what do you consider the industry? Yeah, well, if, if it's all about, if, you, if you're thinking about getting published, yeah. So I think, what do you write, I think? Is uh, the, the thing I always tell people is to read as many journals as possible until you find the ones you love the most, uh, and then send to those first. All right, and, and not just the ones you love, but the ones you think will fit your voice, the ones you think will care for the voice you already have. Uh, and submit to those. So many people think that to get published means you have to submit to the quote unquote prestigious places or the one, there's like a hierarchy, but really the best place to be published is a place where your voice will find a comfortable home. Yes. My name is Trey. Um, hey. I think some things I'll put up, so I'm gonna ask. Um, so I'm a poet and right now I feel like that I'm kind of like structuring myself and kind of like finding my voice and finding a home for my voice. But what tips would you need to like, like will, in your experience, yeah, so the thing I did, I started writing poems pretty seriously in 2011, 2012. And the thing I did was I found poets I love kind of organically or asked around. Um, and then I would do this thing where I would read their acknowledgments in the back of their book to see what poets they thanked. Uh, and then I would read those poets. Because if, for example, if I love Terrence Hayes, I would want to see who taught Terrence Hayes, right? 
if I somehow built my poetic lineage backwards to Robert Hayden, I'd want to know what inspired Robert Hayden, right? Um, to build a poetic lineage is really important, and to be honest about where you fit in it is really important, because whether or not you have quote unquote formal teaching, like I didn't go to school for poetry, I don't have an MFA, I'm not going to get one. Um, I built my own kind of lineage through this idea of history and excitement for a certain kind of writing. Um, and so I started at the top with a, with a very modern contemporary poet I loved and then worked backwards until, you know, I'm at Clifton and then I go backwards from Clifton and then I'm at like Phyllis Wheatley. You know, it, I think it's important to um, build a poetic lineage and find where you fit in and really the, all that is, is doing a lot of reading. You know, my first year of taking poetry seriously, I, I wrote one poem and read almost 100 books because I didn't know where to start. And um, all of those books, and I started so late, so there was already so much text that I, that I had access to. Um, and all those things really built a framework for me how to write. Yeah, what's your name? Hi, uh, I'm Chris. Hey, Chris. Um, this is kind of a more general question, but I heard you mention Moonlight earlier. Um, and I really liked that movie, so like, what did you really think about it? Oh, I loved it. I loved it. I, I think a lot can be said about um, Moonlight's structure and narrative and the tenderness of it, but really just on its face too, it's just a strikingly beautiful film. Um, the colors and the tones of it were really breathtaking. And I, I mean, I think that um, for me, I saw that jump out again on uh, Beale Street. Like I saw Beale Street and was again, I, I thought Beale Street had its like flaws, but it was still just so beautiful. You know, I think his eye um, around color and light is just striking and amazing. Yeah. Maybe I need to watch Beale Street again. I think I had a hard time divorcing it from, I just don't think it translated as well to film. I love the book though. Yeah, what's up, what's your name? This is from a student that's in the prison right now. Uh, did you write August night, uh, August night 2014 completely through, then go back and cross through the words to change the story? Or uh, what exactly was your process in the situation for <laughs> No doubt, that's dope. Uh, yeah, so um, I kind of had, that piece is interesting because I had a predetermined story inside the story. So the thing that you see on the page was predetermined. Mm -hmm. I needed that text, the not crossed out part. So I wrote that first because that was the immovable part. And then I wrote everything else around it, knowing that that was more perfunctory and could get cut. Um, but the, the text that's like bolded and present and not crossed out is all that was on the page in the first draft. Mm -hmm. And then in the second draft, I filled in all the words around those words. Um, and then it went through like four or five drafts to make sure that it all made sense. Mm -hmm. So a guy in my class, I don't know who, but he found out what happened with it. Did you know what happened on that day or you just wrote it? Well, I wrote that after the day. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, that day is, of course, the day Mike Brown was murdered. Um, and there's a series of those in my essay book that's just the date. Um, I think there's one for Tamir Rice, one for Michael Brown, and one for Trayvon Martin. Um, and I, I reflected on that day because the whole thing about those pieces, I don't know if anyone's read all three of them, but the whole thing about that, those pieces is that there is an entire world moving that we are unaware of while someone is immersed in unimaginable grief. Mm -hmm. Right, like I was on a plane like flying back to wherever the fuck, like somewhere, who knows. And, you know, Michael Brown's mother had to grieve her son in the middle of the street. I had no idea. Everyone on the plane had no idea, right? And so I, I think that's fascinating. And so the whole concept about that piece is that within even the most mundane of stories, there is a story that is um, someone's most impossible horror. Hi. Did the non-lived-out part have anything to do with the 
U.S. dropping the second atomic bomb on Nagasaki, or just with the shooting of Mr. Brown by police, or both? Wow, that's a deep reading. Um, as the second part, no, it's just about Michael Brown, but that's a wildly deep reading. Incredible. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's supposed to be that way. Like, it's not, it's not necessarily just a meditation on being on a plane. Um, the idea about fear of flying is kind of in concert with the fragility of life, right? Um, especially because I tried to hone in on the kid who wanted to look out the window um, and see something spectacular or something that they imagined to be spectacular. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a, a dual meditation on fragility, uh, but not about the atomic bomb. That's an incredible reading, though. Yeah. All right, so I'm a little cautious on the next question. Okay, so are you going to write a piece about Mr. Donald Trump? No. No? Um, not, never explicitly. Uh, one, I think there are enough people doing that. Two, I don't particularly find, for what, for at least for me, I don't particularly find, um, his brand of terror fascinating, right? His brand of terror for me is distinctly American. And so uh, to write about America is perhaps write about Donald Trump in some ways. Uh, but um, I think it is entirely not, and I, I admit that I am more cynical perhaps than most, but um, it's not fascinating to me that, he, that a person like Donald Trump rose to power in America. And so there's nothing to really unpack Right. Um, much like America deserved the Green Book winning Best Picture, I think, in some ways, um, America deserves its narcissism, uh, its narcissism reflected back to it. And that, to me, is not that spectacular. Yeah. But also not a politics report. I think politics reporters have done good. At, well, some have done OK about writing about him. Yeah. Um, what do you think about all the celebrities that like are being accused of using black culture to become more popular, like Ariana Grande and like white celebrities? Like yeah. That? Well, I don't. Ha I, I will say this about Ariana Grande, particularly. I feel like I don't particularly have the range for that one because I think there are some complexities that like black women have laid out way better than I have than I could. Um, but I also think. Um, but I also think, yeah, like on its face, do I cringe a little? And I say this as someone who like has an affection for some of her music. Do I cringe when I hear Ana Grande in interviews today? Yeah, a little bit. I think a little bit about like Aquafina. You know what I mean? Um, the problem I think people have with Aquafina's like quote unquote black scent is that it's not consistent. It's like sometimes there and sometimes not. And to me, if it was like all the time, I'd be maybe fine. And if it was none of the time, I'd be definitely fine. But the fact that it's, in Ariana Grande, I feel the same way. The fact that it's sometimes there and sometimes not, I'm like, oh, because you're, you're code switching within a code that is not your code, right? Like, and that is very odd to me, right? Uh, and so I, I don't know with Grande particular, in particular, how this is going to shake out. I, I mean, I think at some point, some musicians particularly get too big and have so many fans, they're kind of untouchable, right? Like, there's no critique of Ariana Grande that could really hold water, unfortunately, because of how the internet works with fandom, particularly, you know. Um, but I, I have been thinking a lot about it. I have been thinking a lot about um, the modes of, of blackface, as it were, that aren't necessarily painting one's face. Um, or when a person attempts to obviously pander towards a very specific culture, uh, the ways they choose to do that. And I think I've been thinking a lot lately mostly about how it appears vocally. So I have been thinking about Ariana Grande and, and Aquafina a lot because I've been thinking about the vocal aspects of that. To me, that is the more fascinating thing than just kind of like on its face of conversations around appropriation, which I think are often flattened and not complex enough for me. Um, I wish conversations around appropriation, only in music, really, um, were more complex and honored the fact that American music was built essentially by black slaves, right? Ex-slaves who loved the blues. But when I think about the vocal shifting to 
cater towards a culture that fascinates me way more because I have more questions about that. Like I would love to, I would love for a reporter to maybe stop Aquafina mid Black Scent ramble and say, "Hey, why are you doing that?" Which is, I don't, and I don't think that's like a mean or inappropriate question. I think that she should have an answer for it. Like I think she should have to answer for it with an answer that makes sense, even if that making sense is bad. And I, it blows my mind that no one is like, why are you switching in and out of this? And I, yeah, I don't know. I heard our, our Ariana Grande had on her like SNL voice. And then she had on her like, there's a rap song on my new album voice. And I was like, huh, weird. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Kayla. Hi, Kayla. Uh, I'm listening to like No Name and Rhapsody. I'm listening to Blue and Odyssey, um, Vince Staples. Uh, I'm listening to The Roots again because I'm working on something with about The Roots right now. Um, so I'm listening to Things Fall Apart. Um, yeah, a lot. But mumble rap, I think, is um, a euphemism for something that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't. On its face, I don't think any of these dudes are really mumbling, right? Like, I can make out what they're saying. And I do think, um, I don't always love the way that the words mumble rap feel like kind of coded. You know what I mean? Um, especially because I often saw them in the year of, something happened where um, the year of quote unquote mumble rap intersected with the year of Chance the Rapper's resurgence, right? And so you got a lot of critics, largely non-black critics, and a lot of fans, largely non-black black fans, being like, well, Chance is real, and all this mumble rap is bad. And that just made me feel weird, right? Part of that is not the fault of those critics or fans. Part of that is because we're just such a binary-driven culture, for worse. I was going to say for better or worse, but it's always for worse, usually. <laughs> um, but um, I, I, I also you know, think that there's some unique value in what's happening rhythmically in those songs. I don't love them all, but I also grew up loving rap music that older people told me was stupid all the time, right? And so as a critic, I cannot in my entire life fathom telling people younger than me that the stuff they're listening to is stupid. I can't, like it just doesn't. The problem with the cultural divide in hip hop right now, in my opinion, is that so many quote unquote old heads are so fucking condescending. And they don't want to build bridges that are just exist already. I couldn't, the year when Future got big and all the, all the old heads were hand wringing and shaking their fists, I couldn't fathom why none of them told these young folks, you might like Outkast's first album. It's there, the bridge is there, the sonic bridge between Future and old Outkast is there, right? Like his cousin is Rico Wade, he grew up listening to the Dungeon Family, you can hear it in his vocals. It, you just don't get that. It's just instead of like shaming folks for what they're listening to, there are very clear generational bridges that could be built. And so that is kind of how I feel about mumble rap. Um, but I also don't love it all. Like I'm not listening to Lil Yachty, you know what I mean? Like it would be disingenuous of me to be like, I'll give it all a chance, because like I, I won't. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't uh, disparage it. Kanye West, um, what's wild to me is that much like Donald Trump, I, I find the current iteration of Kanye West wholly uninteresting, or at least uh, pretty predictable. You know, like he, the narcissist, has become the final form of himself, uh, and that's just kind of, you know, people loved Kanye West's narcissism when he was the underdog who they felt was speaking for him, for them. Right? This isn't. He's always been this way. You know. Yeah, I know that it's a soundbite and people loved it, but like, let, and I, I'm not like wagging my finger at the moment, but like, let's not forget that George Bush doesn't like black people, like, came because he interrupted a literal fundraiser for Hurricane Katrina. You know what I mean? So he's always wanted to be out in the front of things. And, and the thing about provocateurs is, is that when provocateurs get bored provoking the side you're not on, they're going to provoke you, right? That's the whole thing. And so it's not that interesting to me that Kanye West is Kanye West right now. Um, I, I will say that it, 
I do have a few layers of sadness. One, I am sad that those people are so dedicated, who are so dedicated to being his fans, kind of, or just kind of drifting in the wind with him. Two, I'm sad because, you know, I loved Kanye West once, and I don't think a lot of people did, and now really struggling with that. But I also think the failure in, there's a real failure in crowning someone as a genius and not making them repeatedly prove that, mm. right? Because I have to. I mean, I'm not a genius, obviously. But I'm saying every time I sit down to write another book or another poem or whatever, like I have to prove myself to someone. Uh, and the fact that you know, Kanye West was brilliant and did not have to keep proving his brilliance, I think, really harmed him. Oh, hey, everyone's got questions now. Yeah. I'm um, curious of what you, if you're familiar much, well, sorry, the arm chair just broke. Whoa. Um, if you're familiar much with the, the show Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. Does Donald Glover's work in general, just your thoughts on it? I love Atlanta. I, I love Atlanta because I think it's um, weirdly very much like an Octavia Butler book kind of played out on, you know, it's very um, whimsical and futuristic in a way that I don't think it gets enough credit for. It has like really uneven narratives and um, kind of shaky character development that is pleasing. Um, and I, I love Atlanta. I love Atlanta more than I love Donald Glover's musical work now. It, it does seem like his, uh, at least his direction with his writing far outweighs his. Um, yeah. His, his musical taste, but. Um, I wish I liked Awaken My Love. Everyone, I, well, so many people liked it. I wish I could act, I just, I, I kind of hated it. Really? Yeah, I didn't like it. I tried real hard. I listened to it so many times. I listened to it for like literal months. And I would ask people like, what are you hearing that I should be hearing? Um, but I just couldn't. Redbone was cool, I guess. Yeah, I don't know, it wasn't my thing. All right, and a follow-up question. How do you feel about Jordan Peele's uh, upcoming movie, Us? Look, I, listen. Man, I saw that trailer, and I, I'm not, I'm not going to see that shit. I mean, like, y'all can and let me know. I, I think I, there's a certain brand of scary movie that I can't do. And so Get Out, to me, wasn't scary, or at least it was, like, only scary because I lived in Connecticut at the time. Uh, <laughs> but, like, the new joint seems, like, actually scary. You know what I mean? Like, not, like, psychological commentary on the culture scary, although I think it is doing some commentary on the culture, but I think it's also like literally frightening. Like I saw that trailer and I was like, I'm good maybe. Like I love everyone in this movie and I love the premise, but also I can't have nightmares. So I really want to see it. I think I'm gonna have to wait. I can't see it in a theater if I see it. I have to have it like my home. Yeah, like I'm gonna have to see it like in home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, like middle of the day, so I can work it out of my system. But I do want to see it. It does look fascinating, and I love Lupita so much. And um, it it breaks my heart that I won't be contributing to its box office numbers. But like I, I saw the trailer, and I was like, I, I'm good in the movie theater at least. So within the realm of film, um, is Shane your white people a commentary that they bring up? Have you seen it? And so, what are your thoughts on the dialogue? I saw the movie and I saw one episode of the Netflix joint and I didn't think, I didn't keep watching it because I did not think I was the target audience for the messaging. Um, and I wasn't sold on, especially in the movie, I wasn't particularly sold on the messaging itself. I also haven't been in college in a while, you know, and I also haven't like, uh, I think there is a very specific type of black person who goes to a largely white college now and they're dealing with different issues than I did when I was a black person at a largely white college, right? Um, and so I think Dear Black People is attempting to maybe complicate some of those narratives. I just don't have access to them. But I also kind of think the show was maybe not made, it was one of those shows made by black people but messaging out of that realm. Is it still on Netflix? Is it still like? The show is actually much better about processing and unpacking than the movie was. The movie is a little haphazard in yeah. information, but Morgan Freeman jumped on the project and it's been helping with the dialogue. Wait, like literal Morgan Freeman? <laughs> That's cool. At least as advertised. 
When you say helping with the dialogue, is he doing voiceovers? Really? I might, I might tune in. I, love, I thought, yeah, I'm with it. Yeah. I, yeah. And like, I was really suspicious that, um, I guess, like pharmaceutical companies are like investing in rappers to be like spokespeople, I guess. Because, like, Drake had a bar in um, the uh, Sigma mode, too, uh, where he said, like, he took a Xan, but that's also like a brand name drug. Yeah. So, like, I was thinking, like, how much did he get paid for that? You know? Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess I never thought about it. I, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I don't know. I kind of don't have a take on that. I think that um, the overlap between drugs and music altogether, not just, not just rap, but like music has been like interwoven into the fabric of America for a long time. And I suppose it would not be surprising if pharmaceutical companies jumped on that train because it's just a part of the nature, but I have no real like interior ideas on that. I think I also, I think because I don't, um, I mean, this makes me sound like, I don't know, Nancy Reagan or something, but I like don't really know a lot about drugs. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I, and it's, I think because of that, when I listen to rap music that mentions drugs often, it kind of just blends in with the rest of the lyrical landscape. I don't, my ear now, especially as I've gotten older, um, and less like whimsical about lyrics or just lyrics, my ear now is tuned more towards violent, like jarring acts of violence, I think, perhaps. Yeah, I don't know. But that's a good thought. Hey. One last question. One last question. Can I do two? There was like another question. Yeah. Can I do these last yeah, two? Two last questions. Yeah. Um, my question was I, I had a debate with my mom, and, and we were talking about. Like, I grew up, I listened to a lot of R. Kelly. Um, I love R. Kelly. What do you think about separating person from music? Because a few weeks ago, I got in the car with my mom, and my mom was bumping and trapped in the closet. And I was like, Mom, you can't listen to this anymore. Yeah. I was like, what do you mean I can't listen to this? Anymore? I'm personally not trying to separate R. Kelly from shit. Put him in under the jail. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's how I feel about R. Kelly. Uh, but I also think, or I, also, I will say, though, I think R. Kelly is one of the most extreme examples, right? I think there is like nuance around other artists, but I think R. Kelly is like, you know, because I get this a lot, people are like, well, how do I separate art from artists? Like with R. Kelly, and it's like, no, no, well, R. Kelly is like yeah. the worst possible example for this conversation, right? Because um, I do think that what I hear all the time is people asking, well, how do I separate the artist from the art? But what I hear underneath that is, how do I detach my memories from the soundtrack that accompanies them? Yeah. Or how do, I, how do I detach my past affections from my present self, mm -hmm. right? Like, it's never about the art, like, it's personal. The question is personal, and I think what fails is when people make it this overarching distance thing, because you're not, it's not about separating artists from art, it's about the self, right? Um, and I think a thing I always tell people is you have to know what your boundaries are and you have to know when an artist has crossed those boundaries. Also, it bears mentioning that a big problem is scarcity, right? Like people who still listen to R. Kelly are doing so in part because they imagine that no other artist can fill that musical void, which is just like not true. Yeah. I don't know if people remember when R. Kelly was like popular, but like that motherfucker Aaron Hall was pretty much R. Kelly. Like, Aaron Hall was just like another version of R. Kelly. So you can just like listen to some Aaron Hall records and be fine. You know what I mean? Um, and so I, I think all the time about the question I always ask myself is what am I going to lose if I don't listen to this artist? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the question, the answer is like, you know, in a, I've had some hard, you know, I can't, for example, 
a big one with me was Nas, right? I can no longer listen to Nas without thinking about the interview Khalees gave about how he abused her in their marriage. Mm -hmm. And I, I grew up loving Nas. Illmatic is one of the most important rap albums of my lifetime. But in 2018, I had to ask myself, what do I lose by not listening to a Nas album? I don't really lose anything. I can still say Illmatic meant a great deal to me at this time in my life before I was made aware of this thing. And now after this thing, I'm not going to listen to Nas and be fine. People, I think the thing I always want to tell people is that they'll be fine. <laughs> they'll be okay. To, to not listen to R. Kelly is not to deconstruct an entire life, you know? Still, yeah, sorry that you and your mom had to fight over R. Kelly. <laughs> Sorry if anyone has to fight it with their parents over R. Kelly. There was one more that I, yes. Um, how do you pull out inspiration when you feel like it's not there? When I feel like inspiration's not there? When you don't feel like that way. Oh, I don't, I don't, so if I don't feel like inspired to write, I generally don't write. And instead, I do one of the like multiple things that I think helps me have, live a full and healthy life as a writer. Right? which is all the other stuff that I am passionate about as a person. I go on a run, I go to the movies alone. All of these things help the return to the page become easier because I'm con it's the Baldwin thing again, right? I'm witnessing different angles of the world so that I might have better ways to articulate what is behind whatever inspiration block is there. Cool, thank y'all so much.